Today we're going to revisit anatomy, and begin with the first part in a several part series about the head. What you're seeing now is an exploded view of the major bones that comprise the skull. Because it dictates so much of the overall appearance of the surface anatomy, I think it's really important that we spend the time to understand the underlying bones of the head and neck. Before I show you some of the ways that we can simplify the head into forms, I'd like to first show you how we can use the rotation of curves in perspective to study the skull. So since organic forms are composed of curves and three axes, we need to understand how to rotate them. We can start by creating a plane and placing a curve within that. If I turn this plane counterclockwise, the leftmost edge, or edge B, comes closer to the observer, and as a result, it appears taller. I can now draw that curve in from corner to corner on the perspective plane. And as I continue to rotate that counterclockwise, that right vanishing point moves closer to the center, and that plane becomes more foreshortened. The same happens to the curve. When dealing with anatomy, we can divide them up into three planes. The back of the head to the front is the sagittal, horizontal slices up the body is axial, and from ear to ear is known as coronal. When we combine curves in these three anatomical axes, we can create complex organic forms. So let's see how this looks when we apply it to the frontal bone of the skull. When we view the bone in profile, we end up seeing something that looks exactly like a sagittal cut. That's because at this angle, the sagittal view is dominating the entire silhouette. As we turn this clockwise, we foreshorten the sagittal view and see more and more of the coronal view. Or if you think of these curves as ellipses, the degree of the coronal view is becoming larger as we turn it. And the degree of the sagittal ellipse is becoming smaller. Notice as we turn, we see more of that far eye, although it's still obstructed by the nasal bone. Now as it shifts more into a front view, that coronal plane starts to dominate the silhouette, and that far eye is less obstructed by the nasal bone. We'll discuss these structures in just a bit, but I'll leave some links to references in the description below. When I'm doing this type of study, I tend to go back and forth from drawing from a 3D model, and then drawing without reference. I think that without reference phase is really crucial towards building up your intuition, The skull consists of 22 bones, which is probably more than you may have expected. The forehead, brow ridge, and top portion of the eye socket are formed by the frontal bone. This bone connects to the zygomatic, which forms the outer arch of the eye socket. This bone forms a majority of the cheek, and has a projection up to the frontal bone and towards the back of the skull by the ear. Forming the bottom ridge of the eye socket is the maxilla, which connects to both the zygomatic and frontal bones. The maxilla creates the upper portion of the jaw, and connects with the nasal bone to create the bony structure for the nose. The back-facing process of the zygomatic connects to a projection from the temporal bone, creating another arch which allows the lower jaw, or mandible, to socket underneath. The more spherical cranium is formed by the occipital bone and back, the parietal on the upper sides, and the temporal bones on the lower sides by the ear. Connecting the skull to the trunk of the body are the seven cervical vertebrae that socket into the underside of the occipital bone. Although technically they're not part of the neck, many of the neck muscles connect to the shoulder girdle. So what I'm illustrating here is the two bike handle shaped clavicles which span out towards the lateral side of the body, connecting with the scapula which rests on the back of the ribcage. If we position our camera behind and below the skull, we can take a look at some of these joints that we may have overlooked before. From this angle, we can see the spine, which I'm simplifying to a curved cylinder, socket into the occipital bone on the base of the skull. We can also see the temporal bone creating a loop with the zygomatic bone in the front. From here, we can also see that the base of the jaw is very trapezoidal in nature. For the perspective-minded, you can use this trapezoid to generate an edge that leads towards your left vanishing point. You can also use the ellipse degree and minor axis of that vertical cylinder to help figure out your perspective. In a three-quarter view, you can see how the bones curve and fold in on themselves to form the inner structures of the skull. For example, 
The medial portion of the frontal bone forms the inner eye socket. I'm illustrating this by using a heavier line weight on the outer edge and hatching on the inner planes. You also see this on the maxilla where those lateral projections overlap the center portion. So let's have a look at some proportions and simplifications we can use to boil down some of what we looked at so far. The head and neck can be broken down into fourths, with the sternum as your base, the chin a fourth up, the base of the nose at one half, the brow ridge at three quarter, and finally the top of the head. The width of the head in front view is roughly equivalent to five eyeballs wide. In a side view, the jaw emerges about halfway from the length of the skull, and right about where the jaw meets the cranium is where the ear is placed. If you'd like a simpler approach to blocking out the skull than using complex curves, you can modify primitive forms to resemble that skull's shape. One strategy that I use is starting with a box and then rounding out the edges. I then bevel the edges and tilt it up to resemble the bulk of the cranium. You can use some planes and rounded forms to block out the face, but we'll cover this more thoroughly in part two. For me, loosely blocking in the shape that I used in Visual Library Part 1 seems to be effective enough, so long as I don't allow the guidelines to restrain me too much. Remember that anytime we use these form breakdowns, they're just a means to an end. They help us find where our vanishing points are, but the more you can free yourself of them, the more lively and interesting your drawings will look. Sometimes instead of drawing over these guidelines, I'll even just draw them off to the side and use them as a reference for my sketch. This helps me get a sense of the perspective while still developing my intuition. We can use flat shapes stretched into perspective to block out structures like the shoulder girdle. I'll start by drawing the rough shape of the clavicle and scapula in a two-dimensional view, and then I'll transpose that flat plane in perspective, and draw the same shape within it. I can then start to add volume and some of those curves that I used earlier to sketch something that resembles the actual anatomy. All these structures, like the first rib and the spinal column, can be simplified to ellipses, so each of these is going to have a minor axis which can indicate the perspective for us. I can use that same shape I used earlier for the skull to place it in many perspectives and get a sense of how it will look at various angles. It's this sort of extruded whistle shape that I use to figure out how the head will look at different angles. You may have noticed that I'm simplifying the ear here to a cylinder. What this is doing for me is allowing me to see the degree and minor axis of the ear, and it helps me determine the angle and tilt of the head. Another consideration that I make when I'm drawing heads in perspective is the relationship between the eyes and the ears. If we're looking at the character in a front view and the eyes are higher up on the page than the ear, that means that the camera's position below or the head is tilted back. 
And the opposite holds true. If we're looking at the character in a front view and the ears are higher than the eyes, then in that case the camera is positioned above the character looking down. And for good measure, I'll show you a time lapse of how these techniques can be used. Alright guys, that's about it for me this week. In the next part, we're going to be talking about the muscular anatomy of the head and neck. Then in the final portion of this series, we'll talk about variations in the anatomy of the face. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And you can purchase the long-form versions of these videos at gumroad.com slash moderndayjames. And if you enjoy my teaching and want to get all of the long-form videos I make in one month, consider signing up on Patreon for just $5 a month. Or if you'd like more personal instruction, I have group lessons and one-on-one -on -one lessons available. Thank you guys so much. I'll talk to you next week.